Welcome back to the new episode of AI Chronicles, everyone. Today, I have Tuana Chalik, Lead Developer Relations Engineer for Haystack at DeepSet, to talk about different tools and techniques used to build a variety of generative AI applications. And don't worry, we'll of course talk about RAG, because who isn't talking about RAG? Um, hi, Tuana. How are you doing? Hi. I'm good. How are you doing? Ah, so far, so good. Pretty excited about our conversation today. Nice. You ready? Too. Ready to dig in? Yes, let's start. Awesome. OK, first things first. So I'm very curious about how different engineers, developers use the tools that are out there. So my first question for you is that if I asked you to build an online chatbot for a company's website, what tools will you use in your pipeline? And would you uh, could you explain your choice of the tools? Um, all right, so I think this will highly depend on who's building and it will depend on the type of um, developer you are and what level of abstraction you need. So on my end, I will obviously obviously use Haystack. Um, mm -hmm. This is a great tool to orchestrate your AI workflows um, and combine a lot of the technologies that you might need to build an end application. And what I mean by that is usually when you're building something like a chatbot, Everyone thinks about the maybe the large language model like GPT-4 or something like that, but there's actually a lot more that goes into it. So mm. you might have to use a large language model provider like OpenAI, but you also might not be able to use a large language model provider like OpenAI or Mistral or Cohere because that's simply the regulations you work with at your company or similar. So it might mean that you have to use an open source model, serve your own, etc. Um, and then it also usually with a, this type, these types of applications where the chatbot is based on the data that a certain um, service is providing. For example, let's say our own documentation. It means that you all that you need a retrieval step. This is where we start talking about retrieval, augmented generation, etc. Um, for these, I would have to pick. Well, I would assume I have to pick a vector store, but it might also mean that I don't. For example, if my data is provided through a completely different API, sometimes we don't need classical retrieval. It's still retrieval in a sense, but we're just not doing semantic or embedding retrieval. Um, but assuming I have to, I pick a vector store. And there are really good options out there. Some of them provide open source solutions and some of them don't. Um, here, I don't really have a great um, great answers as to which exactly which one I would choose, but I would choose a vector store that has um, vector storage capability inherently, and some great options are like Weaviate, Quadrant, Pinecone, etc. There, there are really great options out there. Um, another thing I would decide on finally is my embedding model. Again, this mm -hmm. could be through a large language model provider. It could be open source, and it could be something that I serve myself. Okay, nice. Okay. Um, and you mentioned rags, and of course, there's no conversation with uh, AI developer without talking about rag. So um, what are the advantages and disadvantages of rag have you seen, especially in production? Oh, this is a big question. So let's start one by one, I would say. I think the the main advantage of rag um, is it's inherent to the fact that we're using a generative uh, language model. This mm -hmm. means that the responses we're getting are a lot more human-like, human-readable, versus what we used to do before, which was mostly around extractive QA, where we maybe ask a question and we just get like a dry response, like this is the answer. This shows us mm -hmm. where the answer is in the piece of context. So the main advantage of RAG is that we are still able to base the answer based off of a specific piece of context we have but it's more human readable, more approachable. Um, but with this comes with a bigger disadvantage, um, which we have many things now in place to avoid it, um, which is however much you do retrieval augmented generation, depending on the model you use, it is still prone to hallucinations. And yeah. there are things that we can do um, to avoid this, but this is something that we have to consider. And this can involve anything from making sure that we're imp uh, improving our retrieval step to optimizing our prompt to make sure that that large language model is responding in the best way possible. Mm 
OK, and so you know, every time I hear hallucination, I find that as one of the biggest challenges of um, any LLMs, let alone just adding the RAG component to it. So what are some of the challenges of building RAG applications and what would you suggest or do to overcome them? There are many, many techniques out there. I think one thing we can possibly focus on for this podcast is the fact that for any RAG application, the response that you're getting from a large language model is highly dependent on what that large language model has as context. So your retrieval step is actually very, very important. If mm -hmm. your retrieval step is not retrieving the relevant uh, data, the relevant context, then we cannot expect the large language model to provide a reasonable response. So mm -hmm. I think one of the, the first step is to get the retrieval step correct. And there are a few things that you can do here. So we talk about retrieval in terms of semantic search and embedding retrieval. Mm -hmm. But for example, in a lot of cases, um, we might need to or have to rely on keyword search. This is also a lot right. cheaper, for example. And in this case, we are really dependent on the quality of the input that the user is providing. Uh, for this, we have lots of different techniques like query expansion, making sure that we are able to um, provide more keyword-based queries that the system can use to get the most relevant data. Mm -hmm. um, we also, uh, well, effectively, we have to, pro to choose which embedding model that we are going to need to use specifically for our domain, maybe our language, maybe, and so on. And if we're doing embedding search, there are also a variety of different techniques we can use to make sure that we're getting the right context. So if anyone's interested, I really recommend looking at hypothetical document embeddings, where uh, we generate hypothetical documents based on the user's query and use those embeddings to search for the most relevant documents on top of um, just simply um, asking for embedding search based on our query. That can also improve. And there's so much more that you can do. For example, you can extract metadata to make sure that you are searching within the right group of documents. You can also do filtering before you do search, et cetera. So all of these are in place to ensure that we retrieve the most relevant um, mm. documents based on the user's query. Once we get that step correct, the next thing, the next challenge is to prompt the large language model the way it expects, obviously. Right, right. Um, and there's a lot we can do there as well. So in in this these cases, I think the most popular large language models out there are actually very performant. Uh, for example, GPT-4, GPT-3, these are very, very performant models. Um, but you may have to tweak and play around with how you build out your whole workflow, whether you need to do re-ranking, filtering based mm. on metadata, et cetera, um, will also depend on uh, what model you're using and whether you need to rely on maybe a smaller model. Gotcha. So you mentioned that, you know, retrieval step is very important. So I'm curious, like, go wrong in using a retrieval model or is it just a choice depending on what use case they're working on or, um, I don't know, just how would, I'm just curious, like how do people go wrong in choosing the right retrieval model? Number one, there's a lot uh, that depends on your domain and language. So mm -hmm. you can't simply go ahead and, well, in some cases actually you can, but you can't simply go ahead and pick whatever uh, retrieval model. In some cases you have to make sure that you're picking the right retrieval model for your domain and your language. Um, okay. There's There's no point in, in um, expecting any old uh, embedding model to, you know, be able to retrieve the right context for German if it's not meant to retrieve anything in German, for Fair. example. Gotcha. Um, and then the other thing, honestly, simply, it could also be a question of what you're able to use. So, mm -hmm. uh, for example, Cahir, OpenAI, Mistral, all of these companies have great embedding models. Um, mm -hmm. But in some cases, we are simply not allowed to or able to use embedding models. These are, uh, mm -hmm. you know, model provider mm -hmm. embedding models. In that oh, case, okay. there's a lot of the, there's a lot that um, to be said around um, 
what you can use and how you can mm. serve these language models. Um, so there's also that consideration. Understood. Got it. Okay, now the next question is something uh, I have heard people talk about and there's still some debate going on every now and then. My question is, given a choice between fine tuning versus RAG versus prompt tuning, which would you choose and for which use cases? And is there even like a concrete answer to this question? I don't think there's a concrete answer to this question, yeah. to be very honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, Number one, fine tuning is simply not an option for a lot of people. Maybe right. we don't have the expertise, maybe we don't have the, the machinery or the access to um, the computation to fine tune our own models. In this case, RAG is a great, great option. Mm -hmm. All of, uh, well, in most cases, all of the models are out there for you to use. The only thing you have to do is simply query them. Mm -hmm. um, so for that reason, I would say given the reward how do you say them? What's the terminology? The the effort um, reward um, the reinforcement spectrum. learning. Yeah. Okay. 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 No. Yeah. No. No. Like as in the effort I'm going to put in to build an application versus like the reward I get at the end of it. Oh, I would say okay. RAG is a great option because a lot of the tooling is already out there, and you can get an application within a few hours. You can have a RAG application running. Um, fine tuning in some cases is just simply required. Um, this can be due to anything from the fact that you're doing RAG in a domain that's not well represented within the embedding models or the uh, generative models that we have out there. Mm -hmm. um, that that they, let's say they just just don't generalize well enough to the sort of terminology we use in that domain. In this case, you may just simply have to use your own. Uh, fine-tuned model. By the way, when you say fine-tuned, I'm just con assuming that we mean both for the retrieval and for the gen generative steps. So my answers are for both of them. Um, I would personally go with RAG because um, it simply works for most of the use cases I would be building, and for most use cases such as you know chat based on your document, chat with your documentation. Um, document QA, all of this, these types of use cases, um, RAG does a great job in my experience. Um, and I'm also talking with someone with the privilege to be able to query uh, GPT-4, et cetera. Um, so I would pick RAG mm -hmm. uh, versus fine tuning because that is a lot of effort. Also right. a lot of effort to collect data and oh, yeah. prepare yeah. that to actually do the fine tuning. Yes. So yeah. I think fine tuning also becomes very resource and computationally expensive too, yes. given the size of the model and the data. And so like, how about prompt tuning, like, or just prompt engineering? Will that just, if you just use prompt engineering or tuning just in isolation and don't use the other two techniques, do you think, especially the use cases that you mentioned, like document QA, chatbot and things like that? Will that Again, work? with whatever prompt tuning you have, if your uh, retrieval step isn't working correctly, however much you tune your prompt, unless you tune your mm. prompt to say possibly ignore all of the context we've retrieved here, <laughs> it's just a it's just an extra to that. If you ask me, like the first step, as I'm I'm going to maintain that the first step is to get the retrieval correct. Right. On top okay. of that, prompt tuning is a great way to um, possibly add some improvements to your responses, but I think prompt tuning is most effective when not it's not necessarily about the quality of the responses you're getting, it's more about what is the interaction or what is the sort of um, behavior I expect from my RAG application. And I can give you an example. Um, let's say you don't want just a simple reply, you want a reply and also some references. Mm -hmm. In this case, you have to start changing your prompt, making sure that the references are included in the augmentation, possibly. Um, this is just an example. So if I want to be able to be very specific as to how I'm getting that response, prompt tuning is a must, not even uh, great to have, it's a must. Got it, got it, cool, okay. So I know you have worked with RAG quite a bit. You like using RAG as well. Um, so 
question about uh, around that is how do you customize a rack pipeline? I remember um, seeing your project where you had summarized Hacker News. Um, so I would love if you could talk about that and with respect to that example or anything else. I love that you asked this question because actually there was one thing that I meant to bring up previously, which I think mm -hmm. is relevant here. Um, when we say RAG, when we talk about RAG, I think because there's that one first um, word there, retrieval, mm -hmm. our first thought is um, semantic search, embedding, retrieval, keyword search, like searching on a, a database that we have, basically. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but actually in the real world use cases, a lot of RAG doesn't happen with um, an embedding model or BM25, it can simply happen based on a query to an external API. And this is where customization becomes quite interesting. Um, and what I mean by that is you might not be semantic doing semantic search or keyword retrieval. You might simply be asking for your latest emails and replying to a question based on your latest emails. Mm -hmm. So it's not about retrieval, it's about querying Gmail maybe. Um, or it's about querying, in my case, Hacker News. Mm. Um, the way I built this was, um, and the way anyone using Haystack builds this, is a pretty neat feature of Haystack. So Haystack, by nature, um, there's only a few things that you need to do to make something a Haystack component. Um, so Haystack is a framework all built in Python. And um, you can go check out the Haystack documentation. And there's, there should be a documentation page on custom components there. But what I had to do was simply create my own custom component in a few lines. And I just simply called it Hacker News Fetcher. And this component expects a number, so a top five, top 10, et cetera. And it returns that many of the trending Hacker News posts. And then I'm able to use that component as a step in my RAG application. So uh -huh. the first thing that happens is a user enters a number and that many Hacker News posts, I query the Hacker News API and I get that many Hacker News posts. And then I literally augment my prompt with the contents of those Hacker News posts. Understood. Okay. That gives a lot more clarity um, in building the whole pipeline. Great. Okay. Uh, Let's switch gears a little bit and um, I'm curious because I just recently had a reading group session with MLOps uh, talking about large context language models. So I want to understand what you think about the small language models versus large context language models. Um, so when you say small language models, are we considering only smaller context LLMs? Yes, small. Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, uh, so it's great that we have larger context language models because that means that um, in an ideal world, we don't have to worry too much about how much we chunk stuff, how much right. we, uh, there's a whole thing that I, we actually didn't talk about before this is preparing mm -hmm. our data. We, um, it would be great if we could just simply say, answer this question based on all of this information oh, mm. ever, forever, but it's just mm -hmm. not possible. Mm -hmm. um, the gist is that a large language model can only Basically, if we put it into very simple terms, basically look at a limited uh, amount of context. Right. And the fact that we can increase that and then I, as a engineer, have to worry less about how much I chunk my data. If I can just provide my whole web page instead of chunks of it, that's great. However, um, and bear in mind, um, I've tested this out maybe a few LLM releases earlier mm -hmm. uh, with OpenAI, mm -hmm. but there are some disadvantages with this. Uh, so there have been a few things that we found where, for example, the attention in the context that a large language model has, um, there's this whole concept of lost in the middle. It's lost actually middle. a year mm -hmm. old now. Um, so maybe we're actually better at this, where we found that a large language model's attention is mostly at the beginning and the end of yep. a uh, context window. What does this mean is, well, in this case, we've actually nulled the purpose of having a large context window 
Yeah. Um, so it's great that I can make the query, but the response I'm getting is maybe missing out on a lot of context simply because it's um, somewhere in the middle of the context window, et cetera. We have a whole suite of um, components out there that we use to avoid this, for example. We have these things called lost in the middle ranker that reshuffles the context window to make it so that if we are using a retriever, to make it so that you shuffle it uh, so that the things that, that make the most sense are brought up to the top. Mm -hmm. um, whereas smaller language models, um, in this case, we have to think a lot more about um, how we're chunking our data and what exactly goes into that context window. So um, there are advantages, there are disadvantages, but also the other thing I want to point out which might make smaller context language models a lot more um, attractive is that in most cases they're cheaper mm. and in most cases um, we're okay with building out a system that eventually provides a shorter context window to a large language model. Um, yeah. So those are my thoughts on this. I think yeah, it's it's more around the advantages of smaller map, smaller small context language models come around the computational and the expenses part, right? Uh, and how resourceful it or how easy it is to use or just you know um, get it from these LLM providers. Got it. Um, I'd like to see some. I would love to see some benchmarks around this. If anyone yeah uh, benchmark the same data set on, because it might mean that it's actually worth the slight drop in maybe um, response quality simply because it's cheaper. Or it, we might find that the response quality is just simply the same for most RAG applications. Bear in mind, a lot of large, um, long context language models come with other advantages um, these days, where, for example, some of them are tuned to be better at generating code versus right. others are not, etc. cetera. So, um, Actually, yeah, that's a big, you know, FYI for this whole conversation we had. I'm basing this off of simple reg, you know, answer this mm. question. But there may simply be some side effects um, where a model has been fine-tuned to do a specific task, which may make it a lot more attractive. Correct, correct. Uh, the paper that we read in the session, it was around, uh, so Google DeepMind worked, like built a benchmark evaluation for these um, large context LM language models. And of course, they mentioned how Gemini uh, 1.5 Pro has like the best results and everything. And it did on um, several number of data sets and whatnot. But I feel, I think um, I would, as you mentioned, like we would want to see a broader benchmark uh, evaluation on different kind of use cases um, for these different models. Um, okay, cool. So, uh, talking about building projects around generative AI, how long does it usually take for you to build a small scale generative AI project? And, you know, it could be any toy project. And I'm basing this question based on oh, your profile. Oh. You have like different um, um, projects uh, or blogs that I've seen, so I'm curious. How long does it take for you to build a project like that? Take this with a pinch of salt, because obviously this depends on the level of experience you have with yeah. these various tools and technologies. But if you do have some experience with um, tools such as, uh, I'm a massive fan of Hugging Face Spaces, I'm a massive fan of Streamlets, Gradio. If you have some experience in these, um, you're able to use Git. Uh, because it's always easier to use Git with Hugging Face Spaces. Um, and you are familiar with a uh, AI orchestration tool like Haystack. To be very honest with you, it's in, a, in an hour or two, you can set up a simple working generative AI application, no problem. Um, and if you like, I can go through each of those tools and what they provide you and what they do. Um, if this, I, and I hope it will be helpful to people, um, because honestly, I think um, people don't appreciate how easy it is to put things in front of others' eyes. Mm -hmm. um, we have so much tooling around uh, building Gen AI applications now. And for example, 
A tool like Haystack is going to allow you to combine all of the different language technologies you might need to build it out. And I'm saying a couple of hours, but of course you can take this further and further and further. You can make your RAG application as sophisticated as you need it to be. But let's say a simple retrieve, uh, augment the prompt and query an LLM. There's, there are three main components there. And Haystack basically allows you to combine those in a logical workflow um, and then design out your, uh, we call it uh, pipelines, AI pipelines. And it also allows you to pick and choose which models you use for which step in the application. Uh, it'll allow you to pick your embedding model, it'll allow you to pick your generative model, and it'll, it'll allow you to draft out a prompt. And all of those things work in unison, and then you've got a working AI application. So now this is only about the logic of how things work, but if you want to build out an application that people actually can see and interact with, um, honestly, setting up something as a hugging face space or something like that is super easy. You can use Streamlit if you're Python savvy. It's a great tool to um, just simply, yeah, just simply set up a very simple UI mm -hmm. for your application. And it's um, integrated for Hugging Face Spaces. So you basically don't need to do anything. You just simply push it to Hugging Face Spaces and you have something in front of people. Um, That's great. Massive fan of those tools. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, good to know. Uh, okay, so, you know, this was a great conversation. And I always like to ask, like, let my last question around advice, especially um, with your experience. Um, what is your advice for the people who want to tinker with new technologies and tools? I know you mentioned a little bit about using these different hugging spaces or hugging face spaces and streamlit and whatnot, but um, what? how would you advise anybody who's just trying to, you know, play around with these tools? I would, uh, we, we take a lot of pride in this, so I would highly recommend just go to the Haystack tutorials because we've tried to make it as simple as possible. Everything in there, you can open up as a collab and simply just hit play. And the only thing you have to do is observe what each step is doing. Mm -hmm. um, and do let me know if something doesn't work because that means we have to fix something. Mm -hmm. um, and we have beginner tutor tutorials and then it goes up to more advanced tutorials. Um, the first one there is actually a very simple RAG application, which means that you'll be able to see every step of the workflow in a very sort of, um, small universe in a very simple universe you'll be able to see how you create embeddings and store them you'll be able to see how you then retrieve them using an embedding model then you'll be able to see how you create a prompt with those contexts and so on and then also query a large language model um, we intended those tutorials to be hand holding you throughout this experience of learning how you might build these types of AI applications. So I highly recommend that. Um, and also, if you are more interested in, you know, this is the tinkering part, but if you're also more interested in what are these language models, what's the mm. latest research, how are these things used, what's, you know, what's going on in the AI world in general, um, and if you're, you have a more sort of research-oriented perspective on things, um, Hugging Face does a great job of highlighting papers. I think they do it every day or every week, something like that. Um, okay. Would recommend uh, everyone to check that out. I think the Hugging Face DevRel team do a great job of um, having a look at what's out there and then selecting some great papers and sharing that with the community. That's good to know. I wasn't aware that they share like uh, some great papers be on weekly basis. That's good. I'll I'll definitely check it out. Um, I think it's weekly, but I'll check it out for you as well and see if I'm wrong there. Awesome. Great. Um, this was really uh, helpful and knowledgeable, uh, Tuana. Thanks for sharing your experience and answers uh, to my questions. Uh, and yeah, thanks again for uh, being on my podcast today. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.